It is my pleasure to welcome Rob Hainsu to the show. Hello, Rob. Hello. Hi, Teos. Thanks very much. So and for everybody coming. who watches Teos, all the great people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have no Sean today, but we have a Rob. Uh, that is a really good trade. Um, and you're here for many reasons, but also because your Kickstarter for 13th Age 2E is live. We're going to definitely talk about that, but I've got a lot I want to pick your brain about. Um, but let's kind of start off with Rob. What is your one unique thing? Whoa. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you want one unique thing in life or um, in professional gaming? Ooh, it's up to you. I think in, I don't know, in gaming, it's, I suspect it's maybe something about, um, my business partner says that when like, like it's time to go ahead and like do a, a card set or a rule, like a, you know, to take a, take a something and then express it through an entire card set or something like that, I can just do it with sort of a, and the bizarre thing is, like I'll mention this because it's kind of weird, and I don't really something you talk about very much. Uh -huh. I'll go ahead and do it, and then at the end of the process, I'll look at it and I'll say, okay, there are six different types of cards, and I just did fifteen of each of them without ever thinking about it or noticing wow. it oh, so or just... anything. And it'll be like, bang, there. You know, and I might be wrong. Like maybe one of them is fourteen or something. You know, yeah. but it's sort of like that's weird. So you can just kind of do. Wow, that's awesome. And I, that is really. And I, the weird part is, like, please understand. We get to talking about card games. Sometimes that means that I have had very ideas that did not work out for a card mm -hmm. game, and normally most people would find that out before they designed an entire card set. <laughs> but simultaneously, it doesn't take me that long to like, like, you know, you know, sort of like, yeah, yeah. oh, and then yeah. So you can um, do that. that. That's awesome. That is an awesome power. I have the opposite power where I can outline endlessly before I ever actually put pen to paper so outline endlessly before you ever put pen to paper so then you end up wait you, like, you put the pen on the paper to make the outlines though well okay fair fair but, and but then the, the outlines... actual, like to actually do the thing i have to like if generally like i might have good ideas but like actually good execution i find comes from going through it in my head a lot and really thinking through the concept over and over and over again, you know, like many shower thoughts, you know, where I'm sort of distracted and walks in the, you know, on a trail where I think about it. And then I feel like I can actually sit down and make the actual thing. Just well, doing the thing is very hard for me without that. I think that both of us have just established that what we need is a little bit of like magic flow through the screen. And <laughs> I'll take a little bit of your outlining. No! <laughs> <laughs> Here's a little bit of execution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, absolutely Magic accomplished. <laughs> we're we're set, man. Thank you well, for bringing that I, up. I actually would have thought that your uh, one unique thing would be in this, from having had the pleasure of playing it at the table with you, uh, is the way in which you delight, or the extent to which you delight in presenting characters with choices, uh, because I often think about how your eyes light up deviously. <laughs> When you are presenting players with a choice, you're like, ooh, that could work if, and you just, it's like talking to like a devil that's doing a bargain, oh, you know, like offering you a bargain. And, and that to me is something I think about very uniquely, Rob Hainsu. One of the weirdest parts of that is, is that at some point, you know, the icon that I use like on social media, it uh -huh, looks, yeah. it's, it's, it's the demonic tutor magic card that looks exactly like me. <laughs> Quite honestly, I have no idea if that's me. <laughs> when the magic art director got it, he walked it over and said, I think this is you. It might not be. That's the thing. It's like it it easily could not be simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so that's a demonic tutor of like, as you say, the, the gleeful figure yeah. and that look yeah. on that face of that of, who, of that of me on that card is pretty extreme. But simultaneously, I also I fired that artist from a job. <laughs> so now I don't know if he. Yes. So I mm -hmm. but but did he have a picture of me? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so it's a very good artist. But the lesson but, is clear. If you draw a bad picture of Rob, even a good one, he may fire you. Uh, it was beforehand. Okay. <laughs> it was, and I don't know if it was cause, and I don't know if it was effect. <laughs> the whole thing is, see, and I like that. I yeah. like not knowing any piece. I don't want to know. I'm sort right. of like, yeah. Right, right. Could That's be. Great. 
love possible. it. Love it. I want to start a bit with your game design and background because you've worked on just an incredible array of projects. You've like you were talking about card games, board games. Uh, some of my favorite card games are yours. Uh, leading RPG teams. Of all that you've done, what are what are some of your favorite design experiences, and kind of why? Why why do those stand out? I was like, yeah, those were awesome. In very different ways, I really enjoyed a couple that I'll mention. Um, Three Dragon Ante was mm -hmm. a um a card game and um i did it when i was at wizards and it really wasn't my job to be designing card games and um i was on vacation i was thinking about my D, &D campaign the one that jonathan and i have been in mm -hmm. since 98. um the characters were about to visit the bar where the parents of the i think it was the orc the half orc who said yeah, you see, actually, maybe we had one of the unique things back then because he was, um, I fought orcs in space. <laughs> um, so, um, and we're visiting, and I wanted them to play a card game while they were there. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted it to be about, I realized as I was on vacation, I was snorkeling around a pink rock. And I thought, well, it's got to be about dragons. <laughs> I don't want it to be poker because that's what everybody does. They go ahead and are like, whoa, characters mm -hmm. in fantasy games play poker. And I'm like, that's depressing. Um, and um, I thought, I don't want it to be like poker. I want it to be a, a game that people don't fold out of. They stay in. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, that means that the high cards win the gold in the center at the end, and the low cards trigger their powers, which are interesting, spaced out by yeah. dragons. So in other words... In a, the space of about five minutes, hmm. I had the idea. That night, I wrote the card set. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's when amazing. I got back to Wizards, there was one mechanic that I was doing stupidly where I had a heads or tails mechanic where things were flipping, which was better, mm. high or low. And gotcha. um, I think it was Henry Stern who worked at Wizards and was a big time magic developer said, oh, you need to just do this one way. And I was like, oh, you're right. And that was the game. That's so cool. So it was basically, I mean, there's a lot more to that, but no, it was basically done. I mean, I had nearly all the powers, but only a couple, only two of them that change and stuff. And so, yeah, a um, beloved game. It's great. Yeah. So and that was a fun. huge part of the lore, right? I mean, Three Dragon Ante is, yeah, it is interesting. all throughout fifth edition lore. And it, yes, it is still, it, I, I love the fact that it's still there. That's really amazing. And it's a game that I can give to, um, I just gave it to a guy I play soccer with um, because it turned out that we have the same birthday. I showed up uh, to play soccer on my birthday with pick up soccer. And, you know, his daughter said, we've been celebrating daddy's birthday. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I was able to give them a copy and they're playing oh, it as great. a family. And I'm like, okay, that's awesome. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what I, that's really yeah, enjoyable. Yeah. Oh, um, I love it. I mean, the other, I mean, the other experience that like just jumps out is, uh, I guess two of them. I really one of my 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 first my first serious game design experience was probably working with um, Robin Laws and Jose Garcia, um, um, working on Shadow Fist. Yeah. And um, technically speaking, I wasn't a designer. Um. But what had happened is I was at the company because oh god. <laughs> Jose had play tested for months at a, in an era when computers couldn't easily swap things. Yeah. He left all the play test data and all the changes in Toronto, flew the United States where we were supposed to lay out the cards and remembered nothing of the play test feedback. Oh. And there was no way to access the threads and find out what had actually happened. And so I remember, remembered sort of, and ended up being like the person saying, I think this card does that. Yeah. And after that, when Robin visited, we got to do card design with him. And it was interesting because it was like, it was like a, for me, that was my, my entry almost into game design. And I got lucky because the truth is magic had just come out. Card, collectible cards were important. No one else knew what to do. And it turned, yeah. so it turned out that the fact that I could do it was a big help. And if I tried to make it as a role-playing game writer at that time, I, I didn't really have the chops, mm -hmm. but collectible cards kind of did awesome. and then working with jonathan on 13th age has been yeah. absolutely wonderful like we've now done three this is the third big book we've done together we did the first 13th age we did 
13th Age Glorantha, and now we're doing 13th Age Second Edition. And um, sometimes we don't entirely know who wrote what. <laughs> Other times we are very clear because we disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and we sometimes let that go all the way into the finished book and talk about it. Right. And um, it's been a really fun, It's it's been a great process. I, mean, really, I love that because that's one of my favorite things. And it made me laugh to see that the Kickstarter page for 2E has your commentary <laughs> to the marketing copy, which is hilarious because it, it, we even mimicked that. So we wrote this book, Forge of Foes, myself with Mike Shea and Scott Fitzgerald Gray, it's this monster yeah. book. And we put in commentary. Wait, Forge, Forge of Foes, it's a monster book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. How and did we I totally miss it? ripped you okay. off. I missed that, it. That idea. Well, yeah. I'll send you a PDF. But, um, okay, thank you. But yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Um, but we, we totally ripped that off because like, it's such a fun idea to, to have those. And so, you know, like Mike and I disagree on a number of topics of how you, right. you know, story versus <laughs> mechanics and so on. And so we have those kind of commentaries because it's just too fun to, to not. And I love, I love reading the difference between how you and Jonathan, uh, see a scene or a scene or a rule or whatever, because what it does is it tells the audience, there's not just one way to use this book or any RPG or any, you know, game like this, like it, you have to yeah. make a call on what you like and how to lean into it. And that's awesome. That good. You've, that is the correct lesson. I think, <laughs> I mean, and you know, when I called a book 13 true ways, I was, <laughs> yeah, you know, trying to hit that very hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes. Oh, fantastic. I so, mean, obviously the joke could get old, but at the moment, <laughs> Nope. It nope. still seems to work because we actually have found new things to disagree on. So, yeah, it's good. So you worked on Feng Shui, Chainmail. You worked, uh, you, you did the highly, or were part of the team on the highly respected three Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Uh, that I was have a very much never... Skip Williams as boss. Yeah. I, I, I have I a friend was... who never stops telling me how wonderful that book is. It's um, a really good book, it isn't is. it? Yeah. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about how you approach being on design teams like that. And, and cause you've, it seems to me looking at your tracker, like you've had a real success in being parts of teams like this. Yeah. Okay. Though that's interesting. I never really officially got to play soccer like in high school or anything like that, but I've always played soccer and it's a team sport. And, um, I tended to, when I played com at all competitively, I ended up being team captain a lot. Bizarrely, I think that helped me interview for doing the uh, fourth edition lead job, which is hilarious. Mm. Um, but also, the team element, the only part of being on teams that I find problematic and the weird part about it is none of the teams you mentioned just now had this problem mm. are when you're actually working with people who actually can't do it. Um, that's mm. the very hard thing because, and it, you know, and everybody tries to pretend it doesn't happen when they're talking about, you know, team building and everything, like, but it does happen. Um, but in cases like the ones you're just talking about, like Feng Shui, Shadow Fist, Forgotten Realms campaign setting, chainmail, yeah. and all that stuff. Like it's just, it is really a joyful experience to have people um, come up with ideas that you won't have yourself, but that you then can help refine or um, and recognize. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the strangest things is that some teams, I think. Okay, here's a guess. My guess is that mm -hmm. one of the things that I might be end up good at and one of the reasons I might be capable of being on these teams is that I'm actually good at recognizing when an idea is good. Mm -hmm. There are times where I've been around people who couldn't tell the difference between a good idea and a bad idea, and it was kind of random which one they picked. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would love a good idea, and then the next day convince themselves the good idea was bad for reasons that that just aren't, aren't true, you know? And there's an element of like, no, 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 no. Don't you get it? You were completely <laughs> right yesterday. You you set yeah. everything on motion. You're good, you know? And so um, so hmm. there's, there's combinations of listening and analysis and uh, 
And, you know, the teams you mentioned, some of those teams you mentioned on, I was very junior on. Mm. Um, and, you know, for example, Forgotten Realms campaign setting, I really appreciated Skip a lot. I mean, Skip, he also did something hilarious, which was that he dealt with management. <laughs> like he, he was like, I'm here to take that hit. Yeah. You do not have to worry about that at all. Like, nope, if that, if they try to come to you, just mm. nope, nope, nope. These decisions we made, I'm the one who takes the heat. And I was like, that was <laughs> honorable because I think he took a, quite a bit of heat like for the mm. decisions he made. And I think they were great. I think he did, you know, mm. I think he, and so, you know, that was really, um, mm. really fun to have that experience. And I, you know, I'm not sure I ever had another, I, I could precisely say that I had another one like that at Wizards, you know, it's like, it's like the, uh, yeah. yeah. so huh. yeah. That's awesome. Um, Nowadays, I'm oftentimes part of teams I'm leading, but I'm also involved in development teams where I'm not the I'm not the lead. Mm -hmm. And um, the difference between design and development can be pretty. Um, you know, I'm I'm more of a designer, but sometimes I develop too. And when yeah. I develop, I should be on a team. <laughs> I I don't know if I should be the lead developer, like especially not on a game I designed, and that's. But, you know, with 13th age, I maybe kind of am. <laughs> Do you know something occurred to yeah. me about that last one? Yeah. The difference between personal life and professional life is very interesting. I think that the truth is, is that in personal life, um, I had very bad examples of listening um, um, sort of shown to me as I was growing up. And I believe that I maybe was not a good listener um, in a large portion of my life. And so therefore, what's weird is that having to work at that, having your natural tendency to be a bad listener and to slide away from that means that they're on teams and just in life, you need to work at it. And maybe, maybe that matters because it's like, mm. I've never been in, I've never been um, able to, <laughs> to uh, coast on being a good listener. Yeah. I, I share that uh, my wife and others had to teach me this <laughs> skill over time. And yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. We could almost have shorthand for that. <laughs> yeah. Character growth <laughs> Character. through, through um, relationship modeling. <laughs> yep. acronym it. I love it. I love it. And we need a game about it. Um, so the, the, I love hearing about these kinds of design teams. I'm, I'm not going to spend forever on this, but I do have to say you were lead for the 4E design team. How did that come to be? And, and what was the experience of leading an edition of D&D, which is something that's in everyone's minds these days uh, with the 2024 rewrite? What was yeah. it like to have this experience? I was, what was I doing? I was probably working in card side and I was doing a, um, a football champions card game. Um, for a little while, I was doing a lot of new games. I think I ended up doing dream blade with Jonathan. I did in later in fighting through dragon anti. Mm -hmm. um, and that was all sort of happening at the same time. So I was kind of probably riding a little bit of a high of like, Hey, this guy's designing games. And I started playing D and D more or less in 1974. Um, although what I was playing was heavily my own design. <laughs> um, so I, Jonathan and I, obviously, you know, I'd been around him the entire time he was leading the third edition team and I was in his, um, his outside play test group. And one of the weird parts about it is when I got hired at wizards, I was one of the only people who'd been playing third, third edition from, for more than a year because everybody else was seeing it. Almost everybody else was seeing it for the first time. And mm -hmm. I had been playing it, yeah. which gave me kind of a jump start um, a bit. And um, well, I, I auditioned like I, in a sense of like, they did interviews, whoever, who wants to be in. Wow. Okay. And um, they, I you know, I think talking with Jonathan had decided me to go ahead and give it a try. Mm -hmm. And um the experience, it was really fun. John, the original th team of designers was me and James White and Andy Collins. Mm -hmm. And that period was very, very entertaining and quite, quite fun and quite creative. 
I think it's possible we got told the wrong thing because if I, I mean, to do it all over again, and certainly like how I've been doing 13th Age, I would not give the advice to go as wild as you can. Don't worry if it's Dungeons and Dragons, just to sign an amazing game and like, we'll figure out it out later. Uh, nah, I'm not sure. I think some of my early design ideas and the, you know, some of them were quite good and others were really too far out as in not acceptable well, I feel... for, for, for Dungeons and Dragons. And so like... I'm not saying the stuff that got published was that. Yeah. I'm saying that right. the early design, that we had multiple iterations of stuff. Mm -hmm. And like when I said that designing a card set was like something I did a lot. Well, James wrote a lot. James, you know, I feel sorry for James in that process because he wrote every single version that we came up with, <laughs> like a really solid piece of it. Wow. And that was a lot. So I feel like fourth edition tried to like fix everything that was a problem with the game right like oh you always need a cleric or you uh, yeah. five minute adventuring day you run out of spell slots you know all these things uh monsters are all over the map in terms of their power you know those kinds of things yep and 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 it felt like just for you just like it was so bold and just saying like boy everything that's you know wrong let's fix it and, and so i'm curious was that something you said, like, hey, let's do this? Or was that like the marching orders from on high or the team just kind of, you know, was that before you arrived? Or I think there's a couple ways to look at that. One is that Dave Noonan had been collecting problems with D&D <laughs> &D, uh -huh. and he... You know, the things you just talked about, Dave had very clearly written all of them out and had a document of like, these are the things that I wish we would deal with. Right. And I think that Dave convinced most of us that maybe we should try to deal with that. Yeah. You know, and um, I, I have less of a nostalgia slash love of old things just because they're old than many mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. And that might've been one of the reasons why I was tapped to be the lead designer because I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, okay. If fifth edition right now is a lot like second edition, eh, you know, it learned yeah. a lot from second edition. Yeah. Well, I wasn't in a position to do that because I didn't like second edition at all mm -hmm. and I didn't play it, you know, so mm -hmm. much. I did not like it. I started up again with third and found it refreshing. I'd been doing many other games in between. And so I wasn't just a D and D guy, and so a lot of the people who worked at WotC, mm -hmm. they were just D and D people. They had they never worked at any other games, you know. And I was much more in the position of, well, no, I've actually yeah. been you know working other places, and so that perspective probably was one of the things that that they wanted when they tapped me. Um, I think that Jonathan had a really good point. I think it was Jonathan. Maybe he said this first, and um, I think he might have been right. Um, but Jonathan said something about, you know, when you're doing a new edition, and and I, I agree with this, and I've said it myself. When you're doing a new edition, change either the system or the world. Maybe mm -hmm. don't change both. Mm -hmm. We didn't do ourselves favors by by doing some interesting design on the world, but changing things, you know, people uh, people spoke third edition like a language, and then simultaneously the system was different and the world was completely different. Mm -hmm. I had people come up to me in elevators and say, you know what my real problem with fourth edition is? And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'm willing to hear. And they would say, <laughs> I do not like what you did with demons and devils. You know, it wasn't okay to go ahead and like dismantle. Uh, and what they didn't say, yeah. use words of to dismantle the blood war, which was a myth, a myth, a legend that right. they had in their mind. It's a really important thing and now we yeah. just sort of went yeah that stuff not so much yeah. you know and so in a weird way i think what happened in in a certain in, in one sense this is something that's important and um mm. i think with that with those actions we made the same mistake that wizards frequently makes which is not entirely understanding the audience mm. the audience is involved as creators because mm -hmm. they get the product and then they use it to tell stories that really matter to them. And um, hmm. it's, I think Jonathan is right in a certain sense. If you're going to change the system and how those stories are created, don't simultaneously tell them that a lot of the stories mm -hmm. they told before are impossible now. Let, let me ask you a question. The, you, there was also fourth edition had the digital tools and all of this that was going around, which clearly had a big business impact. Was that something that, 
like impacted you and the team to deal with these larger corporate aspirations, those big digital goals? Was that kind of on your shoulders or were you separated from that and able to just design? Oh, uh, there's, I don't know. I think there's probably different phases. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely a phase when we were completely separate. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that was a phase when me and Andy and James were working together. Then there was a phase where the, the entire department was given various tasks to do. There was a story team. It was a world's team, I think it was called. And then there was the mechanics team. And then there was a development process. And as we got closer to the reality, those corporate situations mounted mm -hmm. um, to the extent that, um, I mean, Gleamax, they were trying to do Gleamax at that right, time. Right. And um, <laughs> uh, I mean, do people know what Gleamax is now? I hope not. <laughs> mm. it, it, would, it felt like forum software, but it meant to be so much more. Watsi attempted to essentially be half uh, Valve and Steam. Yeah. Um, plus World of Warcraft. Yeah. Um, they wanted Four years a, before. They wanted to be the one place that people went to for games, both to buy them, to play them, to play D and D online. Um, that that cast a heavy mm. a thud because there were times where instead of working on fourth edition because I was the Dungeons and Dragons miniatures person. I was tasked with creating digital minis that never got for used. that table, which was a, a frankly ridiculous waste of time and effort. Like I, you know, partly, partly because I was one of those people in a corporation who said things like that, <laughs> which wasn't always welcome. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and I've so, um, no, not welcome at all. Stephen Raddy McFarland and I, I think we got laid off at the same moment. Somebody said afterwards, like in the next meeting, like, oh, it's really quiet in here. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Stephen and I would be the two people who would raise our hands and say, you've got to be kidding. You know, and so uh, there, there's a lot of angles on this. I mean, there are, yeah. I, I, um, the idea of having martial Martial power, divine power, arcane power, those things were not mandated by design. Those things were like an attempt to go ahead and create a product line yeah. that would then have endless amounts of splat books put out for it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like the game needed that. They definitely yeah. didn't, the game didn't even want that in a weird way, you know. That would not have been my choice of like how to go ahead and like support the game because endless amounts of powers for particular characters is nice perhaps for a card so, game, but mm -hmm. with a role-playing game, oh, you're better mm -hmm. off finding what the target is and then actually, you know, yeah. but that, but that's what was happening. We had to do yeah. it, quote, had to do it because there was an element of you needing to sell books. I yeah. see them behind you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some of them are good. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there were definitely too many powers, uh, no question there. And I think we yep. saw that in how the line changed over time. To, to what yeah, extent, to you know, a, a thing that people will often say as well, you know, I was trying to deal with World of Warcraft and to what extent, and, and I, I say, I asked this question knowing that a lot of people in our circle were like disappearing to World of Warcraft back then, which mm -hmm. is hard if you didn't live through that, you didn't see it, you might not feel yeah, interesting. it. But, but how yeah. much were you on the team thinking about, yeah, we need a way to, to win people over from video games? I think we were told that what we should do, what we needed to do would needed to feel familiar to people mm -hmm. who were playing digital games. It's like that it needed to be, okay. It needed to be simpler in a sense that people could come and play it qu quicker than yeah. having to like master, um, integrate, uh, to master a simulation. Yeah. That makes sense. Let me we, ask you one, one last question. Cause I, I want to, yeah. not if we can't not talk about 13th age, I uh, just one quick question, which is, well, let's try to keep it quick. We'll see. Goal for us. Uh, the OGL during both mm. 4E and quick. 5E. <laughs> I know, I know this is a hard one. This is maximum difficulty. Uh, 4E, 5E, both saw attempts to revoke the OGL. And my understanding, as far as I can piece it out, this wasn't something that was like corporate, you know, the vice president of whatever sends an edict down with no understanding whatsoever of the game. You know, my understanding is in the fourth edition, this it really comes, uh, has been said by Robin Laws from the D&D &D lead. Um, True. 
do you feel like something changed at Wizards in how they saw the OGL? And what do you think, if you happen to know it all, why why has that perspective changed? Or somehow in third edition was like, yeah, the OGL largely it, is a great thing, and then it suddenly isn't. Okay. The insides of corporations and the outsides aren't the same thing. Inside the corporation, Ryan Dancy and um, perhaps uh, Scaff Elias mm -hmm. and um, Jonathan Tweet um, were people who saw the value of, uh, let's say, monopolizing the role-playing game industry's creativity. <laughs> right. Everybody well, does D&D. Everybody does D&D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile multiple people who are inside both brand and the RPG management weren't capable of understanding it uh, in a weird, I, I just use that word. Like mm -hmm. they believed that every penny that was dime that was being spent on somebody else's um, OGL product was money that was coming away from wizards and stuff like, you know, well, yeah. and I say they believed it. I was told stuff like that multiple times by different people, mm. which is as far, I mean, you know, I was, was stupid. Um, yeah. And so the, you know, there were smart people with a business sense based on liking the way the industry had been before, mm -hmm. not really wanting and, and not wanting other people to be able to play in their playpen. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess yeah. that's one way to put it. So uh, it's fantastically interesting. Um, but we got to so, talk about 13th age. We maybe we'll, okay. we'll a different day. We might tackle this in, because I would love to, I, I think it's such a fascinating piece of history and fascinating because we had the five E you know, attempt to revoke. And then now all of a sudden, all these other companies are being brought into D&D Beyond. And so it's fascinating. But um, all right. So 13th Age, uh, we talk about 13th Age all the time on our show, because I think that it's a game that not only has similarities to D&D &D clearly, and it calls back to it, and it's inspired by it, as you've talked about, but it also has all these story focused angles. And it has all of these really neat pieces that you that, you know, I myself, lots of people I know keep wanting to bring into any RPG we play because they're oh, just good. so good. <laughs> OK, awesome. <laughs> and um, I want to know, well, I have, a, I have a lot of questions around this, but so I think you've talked about what inspired you to write 13th Age. But I, so I want to tweak it a bit to say these things like these elements, like one unique thing icons, the escalation die, monsters with nastier specials. What in your design process and goals have led to those kinds of remarkable aspects that are portable and recognizable and, and that excite people to kind of, yeah, I got to use this in every game I ever do. No, let's do this. Yeah. So you just asked a question that was pretty like, hey, man, bunch of cool stuff. Let's do this like uh, you and I, we, we could talk for a long time. Let's do this <laughs> lightning style. Okay. You throw me a concept you want to know, origin story or a, or something about, and I'll answer quick, and then we'll go to the next one. Fantastic. What? The icons. What you got? Icons. I'm pretty sure this was a um, something that Jonathan had been thinking about, probably partly because of Glorantha, um, mm. the world we both loved with the gods as archetypes for your character and how you emulate them, and we... When we started talking about it, we recognized that all the D&D, &D, all D&D &D worlds and fantasy worlds, a lot of them have, well, there's an Elminster or Raceland yeah. or Gandalf, or there's somebody like that. There's an elf, elf queen, maybe a dwarf king. And so we decided, Jonathan, I think, started off with the idea that if characters had a relationship of any type with the, with the organization or with that, that powerful archetypal character, that that would give people more of a grasp and something interesting to start with in the very beginning of campaigns. Fantastic. Which seems to be true. And I understand in 2E, you are kind of digging even deeper into that and kind of clarifying how to use the icons and the relationships between characters in the world. And We went through a really funny process with this because I basically... <laughs> If you asked two game masters how they used icon connections, they weren't going to give you the same answer. And I won't, we, so I started writing example after example of, of like, this is 
this is how you use icon connections because we didn't have any examples at all the first thing <laughs> and I mean, we have to make this useful for people jonathan looked at and said oh, i need to pull out the rules that you're using as you know that you're you haven't ha articulated right. all the specific pieces and then after he started that i yeah we sort of rolled it back to then he wrote new icon write-ups that are not sort of world story but are in fact designed to be most useful to mm -hmm. players trying to figure out how to use icon connections like awesome. saying this is why this icon is important to you here's what it can do for you and here's here's what that'll look like and so there's probably about therefore somewhere around 50 pages that didn't exist before of really solid um help um mm -hmm. about using the storytelling technique that's very much in the player's hands in this edition. It's not the game master at all. That's awesome. And it also settles down. It's not something you roll every session and feel like you have to get through them. It's something you do once per arc, which, you know, maybe it's two or three sessions. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yep. I mean, one unique thing, I was just reading the blog post you have on Pelgrane Press where it's like you're huh. talking about your character came from a painting and this <laughs> resulted in the DM crafting an encounter that where you were two dimensional, all fighting inside of a painting. And <laughs> yes. it's just, you know, I was at one point uh, contracted by MCDM to write up a, a sort of character backstory creation. You know, what is your character history? But the whole goal being, you know, that at the end, the, uh, sit down for your first session and you should know who your character is. Right. And we went through so much work. And in the end, it just kind of didn't pan out as a project. And one of the things I asked the whole time, because we were kind of, it was a fairly yeah. convoluted approach. And I said quite clearly, you know, this may be too convoluted and maybe too many pages. And I, but I kept asking myself, and I would even say this to James and Tricasa, I would say, we have to compare against one unique thing, one unique thing, <laughs> because you could just say, come up with one unique thing about your character. And it may be way more effective than 50 pages of backstory oh. that you go through in a book, right? Like, <laughs> how did you come up with this? Like, it's so good. It's, it works so well. I'm doing a lot of interviews right now. And I'm about to do an interview about the, where somebody asked me to read something from an old D&D &D history. And I'm going to read from the Arduin Grimoire. I noticed that one of the things in it was like these special abilities for um, characters. And some of them are like, you're the child of a demon, plus two to all your stats. Um, <laughs> As a kid, I was really into characters that were interesting. I think mm -hmm. that, I think that, like when you look at heroic myth, when you look at heroes, when you look at Glorantha, when you look at things, characters that the memorable characters and the characters in fiction, they have something about them that's different. And yeah. um, I was very frustrated at Wizards because everything had to fit. At that time, everything had to fit an organized play mold, you know, and it's like everybody's going to be able to play in the same thing. I'm like, no, it's like the individual table is what's important. Yeah. And so um, I just thought that it would be perfect if people got to tell the game master from the beginning kind of what they wanted the campaign to be about by saying, this is how I'm different than everybody else. Yeah. And yeah. I called it the one unique thing, the beginning. And, uh, Sometimes we call it the unique. And uh, how did I, I don't know. I mean, it was yeah. really pretty immediate. It was like one of the, the things that happened right away were Jonathan and the icons, me and the one unique thing. Yeah. Backgrounds came later. So here's another question. So, and, and I love backgrounds. I can talk about that too, especially comparing to how Daggerheart uh, with the critical role RPG is, is playing off of those concepts. But 13th Age monsters have this reputation for being a lot of fun. They've got very engaging play. Um, and, and I think I've heard that you are looking at sort of chain, um, that you've streamlined monsters or changed monsters, revised. And so what do you think drives them being so much fun? And what have you done in TUI? Partly, it's that if a monster is a powerful, magical being, rather than trying to give it, OK. There are certain monsters that absolutely break this mold where we gave them a ton of abilities and I'll just be quiet because it doesn't apply to them. But a lot mm -hmm. of times what you can do is you can go ahead and say, look, I know you're a really powerful monster that can accomplish a great deal, but you're also going to make an attack 
And when you make that attack, what you roll on your attack will determine which part of your powerful magic is coming out. Mm. In certain cases, and I think this is less true right now in the core book than it is, say, in the bestiaries, there'll be natural even and natural odd results, and they'll right. be very different. So it's the roll right of now, the die, odd or even, drives something happening, right? Which yes. surprises everybody. Yes. And in the core book right now, I'd say that's not used as much. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan has like recently come to a conclusion that's very interesting that hasn't been fully expressed in what people saw in the playtest play packet, but is coming in the little update I give. Mm. And that is that a lot of times we had abilities that like triggered on a natural even, any natural even, hit or miss. And it's like, if natural even hit or miss, and um, this creature grabs you, or natural even hit or miss, and uh, you take 20 ongoing poison damage because, wow, that stinger went in deep. Right. We've changed, he changed that to, right now, there's a few of those creatures, a bunch of them, where we're going natural two plus that happens, unless you roll a save. And the save is a 50-50 chance. So it turns it around and makes the player do something. Mm -hmm. So that's one way we're changing things in 2E. The other way we've changed a lot of things in 2E, like when we did the original core book, like we didn't necessarily have a super understanding of what was fun. And uh -huh. so I think partly when people are saying second edition, uh, 13th Age Monsters are fun, they're also talking about the bestiaries, um, which mm -hmm. were a heck of a lot of fun, you know? And so... And so what I think what's happened is, is that in this particular core book, we now have made an effort to make mm, all the specific creatures play very differently than the other creatures. Nice. You know, um, that hammer demon is going to hit you. And when it does, you're going to have to roll an O. Oh, if, if you fail to save, you lost your next move action. Oh, and guess what? If you're standing next to this thing, when it starts its turn, it really destroys you. So in other words, and then it's like, so So what do people do about that? Do they try to give that person an extra move action? Do they try to like, you know, kill the creature? You know, they, but right. in other words, we're setting up lots and lots of interesting questions. I think for me, I don't normally speak. Yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm usually, the first, what I noticed with 5e a little bit was that the original monster manual they did was really super boring. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just kind of like, how would you run this as a game master and keep your attention? Uh -huh. This is like crazy boring. Like you got this amazing creature and you tell me this is what it is. Oh, and also look at this long list of spells. Oh, my head hurts. You know, <laughs> I we, agree with you. Yep. We don't do that. Um, uh -huh. And so, but I did notice later on, there were some of their books later on and that I thought, oh, hey, that's interesting design. Yeah. There's an interesting yeah. monster design here where it's like th they've got stuff happening that's not yeah. entirely predictable and you know, it could go in a couple of different directions. And I think that's one of the things so like yeah. we try to make it so mm -hmm. that there's more than one direction things could play out with a monster. Yeah. And, um, and also related to like that fight inside that you were talking about the fight inside of a painting that we're inside yeah. of a painting because yeah. Ash stepped out of a painting and now she's, you know, I, well, that painting, I designed the monsters for that, but I put them together on the basis that I thought, wow, I think the synergy of these creatures is going to be really interesting. And it was, you know, and so this edition has a lot of advice about what the monster roles are and how you can um, use them. And Jonathan also did something interesting because um, he went ahead and designed a whole bunch of monster powers for those roles that you should put on your design your own monsters and a lot of them we never used yeah. they're like they're things that we've never put on a monster but here they're really perfect examples of that role and so uh yeah i'm kind of happy about the fact that it's like design it yourself tools and it's not all stuff you've seen awesome let me ask you one more question yep. um post the kickstarter you've got the kickstarter for for 2e right now yep uh do you already have plans beyond that um beyond finishing the two books that we have on the Kickstarter, you mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, Another, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we do. Um, Gareth Ryder Hanrahan, who wrote Eyes of the Stone Thief and many other nice. amazing books, like Book of Ages is probably, I don't know, maybe my favorite um, other book in the line. Um, he has an adventure called Prophets of the Pyre um, that is an adventure that takes you from first level through 10th level. And um, I think, assuming it stays the same ish it will not be as large as eyes of the stone thief but it is big 
Awesome. Um, it's a big, you know, call it a mega adventure. So that'll, we're, um, JM Defogi is working on that now. Ooh, cool. Um, as far as developing it goes, because Gar finished the design. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when two ad second edition is really done, it'll be like, there'll be certain things to be adjusted, but not that much. And oh. I think some battle building, um, actually, cool. well, changing the battle building. Mm -hmm. um, I'm work I've got a book called Icon Followers, which is actually, Ooh. the real name is Bestiary 3 Icon Followers. So it's a book of NPCs that mm -hmm. are um, mainly, uh, mainly NPC style monsters connected to the icons. And I'm, it's something that people asked about from the very start. Fantastic. And I finally did it along with some help from other people who've written pieces. And, um, but I still got a, it's about 70% or 75% done. Um, uh. So I'm looking forward to getting that out. Um, there's a, the Dragon Hall book with a mosaic book. There's another mosaic book called Behemoths which um, will be out. I mean, we're going to wait until after second edition comes out, but it, it'll be out shortly after that. So there's at least those three. Wow. Great. And there's one other thing that I am mentioning to everybody, because it's in the book. Um, I'm going to be working on a book that I call Further Adventurers, uh, a book of classes. Mm. And it's going to have... Probably the classes from 13 True Ways, at least some of them. And it's going to have new stuff for several of the classes that are in the core book. And it will have micro classes, like an ice mage. <laughs> yeah. Not somebody that you need to to have pages mm -hmm. of powers for, but instead of very focused, actually, that you can play this, levels 1 through 10, you know, and it's an experience that's different than other classes. So that. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, Rob, we've got to go. I'd, I'd love to talk to you longer. Uh, we'll have to find a way to do that. Um, Good. Congratulations on the success of the Kickstarter thus far. You, it ends June 6th, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, go to Kickstarter, search for 13th Age 2nd Edition. And uh, all the links are in our show notes. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll find all the links below. Um, so, Rob... Um, uh, any, any, uh, where do people find you? What's um, the best way to, to hunt you down? These days you can find me at Rob Hanso, blog, dot blogspot.com. Um, Fantastic. my personal social media presence has gone way down. So yeah, I haven't, I, I like, technically <laughs> I have a Twitter account, but oh, I wouldn't know it. Um, I think that I'm going to experiment after after dealing, finishing 13th age, I'm going to like be going in and experimenting with like the whole blue sky mastodon, everything like that. Yeah. But honestly, I haven't been, yeah, I haven't been you, doing much. Were, yeah. You're, we'll so it's blog spot. later. It's, it's, uh, it's so, so out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so, well, you know, when I talk to people I respect and like, I get sort of things like that, which doesn't yeah. make me like, oh, yeah. I got to run right over and, you know, no, no, yeah, it's, it's no. very sane to avoid these platforms these days because it's very hard to filter it. I like Mastodon because I can filter everything very carefully, but a lot okay. of people aren't there. So anyway. Right. Well, I'm, oh, that's funny. Uh, you're filtering. <laughs> you're filtering people like me who aren't there. OK, well, there's we, a vote for Mastodon. Well, I, I filter out a lot, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and therefore, I get the experience I want. But it is narrow because a lot of people are not there to yep. give me the larger experience like companies right. and so on. But anyway. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you, Rob, for being Thank on you. our show. Super awesome. Uh, I have like a million more questions I want to ask you. So you've got to launch third edition is the only way. Or we could just meet for some other reason. I would like to meet for some other reason. Big time. <laughs> like, let's 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 do that. Awesome. Thanks so and, much, Rob. Uh, then you can go ahead and like like create a, um, a series of wild questions um, going in all different directions. And we'll see how long it takes us. I love it. So. All right. All right. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate Good. it. We hope you all enjoyed the uh, awesome conversation with Rob Heinzu. Clearly, we could have gone on forever if he didn't have another interview and we didn't want to actually keep this show to <laughs> an hour-ish. But uh, we could not do it without everybody who supports the show. Thank you so much for everybody who helps us keep the lights on. Thank you to our Master of Dungeons supporters. Special shout out to our Master of Realms and our Master of the Multiverse patrons. Uh, patrons get our show notes. We periodically send additional things as well from time to time and access to our Discord, which has been really an incredible community. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Master of Realms, you are in our show notes. We thank you so much. Master of the Multiverse, I shout you out right now. 
Keith Aman of The Monsters Know What They're Doing, Lou Anders from Lazy Wolf Studios at lazywolfstudios.com, Calvin Bridges Avalos, Craig Bailey, David Bastianson, Steve Bissonnette, Merrick Blackman, Evil John, John Carney, Will Doyle, the author of many D&D things, including Tomb of Annihilation and The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, Andy Edmonds at Nerdonomicon.com, The Mighty Jurd, Ben Heisler and Paige Laitman, Sean Hurst, Brian King, Jim Klinger, aka DM Prime Mover, Chad Lynch, Paul, thank you for your question, Paul Mata, The Mathemagician, Eric Mengi, John Mickey, Sean Molly, Falcon Neal, Tom Nelson of the Deck of Player Safety, so good to see it on Demiplane, Mike Olson, Mighty Zeus, Post Fiction RPG Audio, Robert Pasley, Vladimir Prenner from Croatia, thanks for that awesome search engine, Chance Russo at Drago Russo, Ross Sandberg, Andy Shockney, Krishna Simonse, Jeremy Taloman from the D&D TV podcast, Tres, Joe Tyler, Marcelo de Velasquez, the Valiant DM, James Walton, Graham Ward, Javier Wasiak, and Chris Webster. Thank you all so much. If you love the show, please consider supporting the Patreon at patreon.com slash mastering D&D. Rate us on whatever your podcast listening uh, listener of choice is. Uh, we really appreciate you subscribing on YouTube if you enjoy that uh, as well. So you can find me on alphastream.org. You can find Sean Merwin on all the social Mer uh, media places at Sean Merwin. And you can find Mastering D&D &D at Mastering D&D &D on the various platforms. What are we going to do now? Well, we are going to ponder how awesome it will be when we get these second edition 13th age books. I personally cannot wait. I've backed it. I hope you will too.